how to, to do evangelism and do series and things like that. There was another family there, and they had two little boys, but little Tommy is the one that I remember because every time we, every night we had worship, and we would go in and, and do a Vespers type thing, a message, and then worship, and we'd always take song requests. And every single night, as soon as someone says, is there any song request, Tommy, 272, just like a little five-year-old, 272 every time, give me the Bible. Anyways, let's pray, we'll get into this message. Father, I just ask that you will bless as we go into this message, we're in the second part of the three-part series. Lord, I pray that uh, this message will take its place in our heart, and it will increase our faith and help us to um, trust more in the word. In Jesus' name we pray. So the word of God, this part, is what is the purpose. In the year of AD 303, the Roman Emperor Diocletian issued a decree for which he hoped would extinguish the spreading flames of Christianity. One of his primary objectives was the seizure and destruction of the Christian scriptures. Later that year, officials enforced the decree in northern Africa when one of the targets was Felix, Bishop of Tabuca a village near Carthage. The mayor of the town ordered Felix to hand over his scriptures, and though some judges were willing to accept just scraps of parchment, Felix refused to surrender the word of God at the insistence of mere men. Resolutely, he resisted compromise. Roman authorities finally shipped Felix to Italy, where he paid for his stubbornness with his life. On August 30, as the record puts it, with pious obstinacy. He laid down his life rather than surrender the Gospels. With holy stubbornness, he laid down his life and ex rather than give up the Gospels. What would lead a man to do that? What would cause someone to choose God's word over their own life? I want to show you a list of martyrs whose only crime was trying to teach and preserve God's word. This is from the Old Testament. Isaiah was sawn in half, Jeremiah died by stoning, Ezekiel was stoned to death, Micaiah killed by Ahab, Amos killed by Amaziah's son, and Zacharias was killed at the altar for teaching, for proclaiming, for trying to preserve God's word and make sure that the whole society, the culture at the time, those living there had access to it. And that's just the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we read about John the Baptist who was beheaded, Stephen was stoned to death, Peter was crucified upside down, James killed by Herod Agrippa, Andrew killed by crucifixion, Paul was beheaded by Nero, Philip, Thomas, Jude, Matthew, all martyred. And that was just the apostles and the, those who followed them in the New Testament times. But after them, there was millions of Waldensians. Huss and Tyndall were both martyred only because they were trying to make sure that God's word was preserved for us today. And I asked the question, why would God allow so many of his servants, so many of his friends, so many of his followers to be martyred? For the sake of preserving his word. I want that question to set in for just a minute. Because the truth is. Is what these men and women gave their lives for. We all too often reluctantly open up. At a party or maybe when we come to church or for a brief moment when we're lost or in pain, as opposed to cherish the treasure that God has given us. Let's review what we learned last week, last time, last, well, not last week, sorry, last time I was here. The Bible is the most scrutinized book in the world because of its claims of divine origin. Now this should come as no surprise if it is a book that is the author is claiming to be God or it's, it's, it's claiming to be God's word, then we only have two choices. We either follow it or pay the consequences of not following it. And if we want to quiet our, our, our conscience, then the only way we can do is to just do away with the Bible completely. And that way we can have a clear conscience as we go around living the life that we want to live. So it's been scrutinized as a result of that. But given enough time, science always corroborates the claims of the Bible. Through archaeology or other, other ways, it always corroborates the claims of the Bible. We also learned the three-step criteria that was used to develop the Protestant Bible that we have now and why we do not accept the apocryphal writings that we find in the Catholic Church. And that three-step criteria is divinely commissioned authorship, i.e. prophet, apostle, or someone closely connected, consistency with past revelation, whatever is going to be in the Bible is going to be consistent with the widely accepted Old Testament, 
And number three, self-authentication. It is God's truth whether we accept it or not, but the books at that time had to be preserved at the time of compiling what we have as the canon. And then finally, we learn that Jesus wants to give us a message through his word and that if we keep reading our Bibles, he will astonish us with what he shows us. Even when we feel like we have not gained anything from our reading of the word, God is using it to accomplish his purposes as Isaiah teaches us in Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So we, so we looked at last week, and now I want to go into a new topic, which leads us to our first question today. What is the purpose? The Holy Bible. What is the purpose of the Bible? Now, I'll just go ahead and take some, some answers right now. What is the purpose of the Bible? To teach us God's ways. Teach us God's ways. Very good. Instruction? Reveal Jesus to us, very good. Teach faith and love. Teach faith and love, very good. Lead us to eternal life. Lead us to eternal life, okay. To correct us. To correct us. Anybody else? To give us peace in times of trouble. Give us peace in times of trouble, very good. History. To straighten us. In history. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm having a hard time hearing. History. History to, to, to reveal past to us. Amen. Absolutely. What? Salvation. Salvation. Yes. These are all fantastic answers. I want to take it just a little bit further today because there's something inside the Bible that we are missing collectively as a church, as a group, as members of society. And I want to get us thinking a little bit more in terms of what the Bible is here and what the purpose of the Bible is. All these are fantastic answers and they are all right. The Bible absolutely does that. But does it give us even more? Does it offer us even more than what we just collectively said here? So let's look at it. What is the purpose of the Bible? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, uh, Luke teaches us, So now, brother, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The Bible then, according to Luke, is designed to do what to us? Build us up. It's designed to build us up. We may come to Jesus just as we are, but through the word, God, his Bible, through his word, he builds us up and slowly changes us. That's why we've come up with the phrases, I thank God, I'm sorry, I'm not the man that I should be, but I thank God I'm not the man that I used to be. I came to Jesus just as I was, now he's taken me, and through his word he has cleansed me, and he has built me up into the man that you see standing before you today. And as I continue in God's word and allow him to, he's going to build me up into even a greater man. So James gives us insight into how this takes place. So the Bible builds us up, but how does that happen? James chapter 1, verse 21, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the what? Implanted, Implanted word, which is able to save your soul. What does it mean to have the word implanted to us? Now, I don't want to overstep. I don't want to, 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 to go past this, this phrase there, which is able to save your souls. The Bible saves our souls. It delivers to God. But it's through the implanting of his word. A while ago, I had a tooth. It got infected. I, I didn't do it. In, I didn't take care of it in time. And so they had to just pull up. That was the only solution. And then just recently, like a month ago... I got an implant put in. That is actually a dentist taking something, uh, I'm not a dentist, a fake tooth anyways, and putting it in my gum to take the place of the old tooth that was there and to enhance my experience in life. Amen? It's much easier to chew when you have something there instead of just a gum. That's just, it's just missing there. And so the dentist did that for me. God is telling us that he implants his word in us to build us up, to save our souls. And we could read this as the word must be implanted in us. Now Peter's going to take this thought just a little bit further and he's going to show us the importance of the message that he's trying to convey to us. This is 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. As his divine power has given to us all things which pertain, pertain to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us through glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the what? Divine nature. 
divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So through the promises of God, as he builds us up, as he implants his word into our hearts, what do we partake of? The what? Now help me if I'm wrong here. Am I of a divine nature? When you guys look at Pastor Jay, you don't look, oh, there's the divine being, right? And if you do, then we really have to do some Bible study, all right? Because I am not divine in any way, but God is saying that through his promises, we partake in what nature? Divine. The divine nature, and we escape our own nature. Now, it's very interesting. You have to understand something, that we are born sinners, and we are sinners from birth, and we want to do things that are evil. We want to do things that are bad. That's the way we come. But God says through his promises, he can change us. That's why someone like I, who is standing here now, can go from someone who wants to drink and smoke and just find girls. That's why you skip my pleasure to someone who now wants to find the drinker, who now wants to find the smoker, who now wants to find those girls that need Jesus and give them Bible studies and lead them to God who can change their lives and help them live according to his divine nature. Amen? It's through his word that he changes our very nature and not just the things that we do, but our desires and our impulses that lead us to do them. Now, I don't care. I almost got to hell myself. There's another slide I have to go to first. I don't care what you struggle with. I don't care whatever sin that so easily besets you. God says that through his word, he is able to change us. When his word is implanted in you, it literally changes who you are. It changes your very nature. It changes your desires. It changes your impulses. Now, friends, never make, never make God small. The greatest injustice we do is to make God small. You ever played solitaire before? Like the card game, solitaire, you know, like you, you put down the cards and one's up and then two down, blah, 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 and you just go through until like, I think there's seven or something, I don't know if I was doing like I could do it. And then you flip over cards and you like this and get rid of all the cards that are down and put up on the aces or whatever and remove all the cards that are in your pile, right? You guys know this game, right? And as you play this game, the, 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 the reason why you're playing it is because you want to love. You want to win, you want to kill time, you want to beat it, right? Have any of you ever cheated in solitaire? <laughs> so I had this grandmother, and she was really good at this, right? She would lay out these cards, play in solitaire, so she did to pass her time. And then she would try to win every time, and I would watch her, and if she got to a spot where she couldn't move, she would just pull a card out that was buried, and she'd flip it up. And if she could play it, she would play it. And if she couldn't, she'd slip it in the pile, she'd grab another one. And I'm like, Grandma, why are you cheating? It's just a game that I'll do my time. Like, the only person you can beat is yourself. And she's like, I want to win. Right? We kind of take this philosophy to God. We want to be successful in life, and so instead of letting God's word change us, we try to change God or his word to fit our perception of how we should live. But God tells us never do that. Because I am able, I am capable, my heart is not sure that I cannot change, that I, that I cannot save. I am able to change your very nature. I am able to, to take you from someone who desires and is bent on doing this particular habit or this particular action and make it so that you never even want to do it any longer. And the only thing preventing him from doing that in your life and in my life is my relationship with him, is my faith in him. And you're saying right now, all right, this sounds really good. I want what you're preaching. I want this, but how do I know that God's word is able to change me? How do I know that God can take me from my very nature, the things that I have been on doing, and he can change that and give me a whole new desire? How do I know that God's word is able to do that? You see, we have to realize something very important, a principle that the devil tries to hide from us all the time. The principle is John, sorry, Psalms 19.1. The heavens do what? Declare. Declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The Bible states emphatically that the heaven declares what? The glory of God. It shows us his handiwork. 
And why is this such an important principle? Why is it so important for me to understand that when I look out there and I see the sky, and when I look out there and I see the clouds and the sun and the moon and the stars and beautiful Lake Superior and all these tall trees and rocky formations that we all live up here for because we love looking at that nature, it appeals to us. Why is it so important that when I see that, it shows me, it declares to me God's goodness, the glory of God, it declares to me his handiwork. Why is that principle so important? Turn with me to Psalms chapter 33. Turn with me to Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Now see, everything that I have shown you so far, you know, you don't struggle with that. And what I'm about to show you right now, you already know too. But there's a disconnect between what we know and what we're practicing. There's a disconnect from what we know and what we believe. And we have to understand that we need to break through this disconnect and get to the other side so that what we know, we believe, and what we believe, we live. Amen? And so I'm looking at Psalms chapter 33, and I'm going to start in verse 6. Psalms 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, I just want to pause here just for a second. How did God make the heavens and everything else that we see? He spoke it. By his word. And then in verse 9, he goes further, Dave goes further to say what you just said. For he spake. And it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. God did not need to form everything that we see out there because his word has power in it. God did not have to shape the moon, he didn't have to shape the, the, the sun, he didn't have to shape the stars, he didn't have to shape Lake, Lake Superior or any of the other great lakes. He didn't have to shape these mountains or anything, he spoke, and when he spoke it happened, and that reveals to us that God's word has creative powers in it. Now let me give you an illustration so you can understand this. If God were standing here today and he said, look at the pink elephant in the corner, it would literally be there. Now, the problem that we have is that if Pastor Jane was standing up here and I said, look at that pink elephant in the corner, you guys wouldn't even look. And the reason why you wouldn't look is because you would be like, that's dumb. Elephants don't live in this area. Elephants aren't even beef. And by the way, there's no way an elephant can even fit in this building to get into that corner. So it's just an impossibility you guys won't even look. But if Jesus was standing here and he said, look at the pink elephant in that corner, if it had not been there before he said that, it would suddenly exist and it would be in that corner. But here's the challenge. And here's the problem. Most of you, and myself all too often, come to the word of God as if Jay is speaking it. And not that God has spoken it. Because when Jesus tells us, look at the pink elephant in the corner, we don't turn our heads to see the marvelous creation he just made. Bible tells us very plainly that there is power in God's word. That he speaks and creation happens. That he speaks and his plans go out to accomplish their purpose. That he speaks and change needs to take place because God has spoken it. You see, other books may be inspiring. But the Bible is inspired to give life. We read other books and oh, they warm our hearts. They give us the chills. They give us the warm fuzzies. They give us peace. They lift the weight of the world off our shoulders at times. We think that they are so comforting. They give us thoughts. They give us, they give us cliches that we use in conversations all through life. We read these things because they inspire us. But the difference between those books and the Bible is that they may be inspiring to us. But the Bible is inspired. But you may be thinking to yourself right now, well, hold on a second. If this is the truth, if what you're saying is true, then why is not everybody changed to read the Bible? Why doesn't everybody who comes to the Bible, why doesn't everybody who opens those pages and starts reading, why doesn't everybody who even is marveled and amazed at what they heard by the Bible, 
why isn't everybody changed who reads it? I mean, we can even go further. Wasn't there a group of people that lived in Jesus' day that knew the Bible through and through, that could quote scripture readily and any time they wanted to, but yet they were never changed by the word that they were quoting? How does that take place? Hebrews 4.2 For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not meant with faith in those who heard it. Let that not be said about you. Let that not be said about me. Let it not be said that I heard the word, that I read the word, that I went to the word, but it had no effect in me because I didn't believe it. Because God is telling us that his word has power and it's going to change our situation. It's going to change our relationships. It's going to change my very life. But what's preventing it from accomplishing a purpose is me not believing that he has the power to do it. We need to mix the word with faith. Let me rephrase that a little bit differently. What Paul is telling us is that if we believe that God's word can accomplish what he says it can accomplish. It will change your life. It will change your situation. It will change your mindset. It will give you purpose. But if we don't believe it, it's a little more than any other book you've ever read. Do you believe God's word will do what it says it will do? Yeah. Do you believe that? George Whitfield wrote this concerning the Pharisees. They had everything but that one thing that is everything. The Pharisees didn't have belief. They didn't have faith. They were great scholars and they quoted the Bible at nauseum, but they were using it as a way to manipulate the masses and control people and gain power. But God says, do you believe my word? Are you putting your faith in what I say. Do you lack faith? Are you struggling to believe the claims of the Bible? Turn with me to John chapter 5. Turn with me to John chapter 5. This is for those of us who lack faith, those of us who are struggling to believe that God's word has the power to change my life, that God's word has the ability to do something different than I've always seen in my life. John chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 2 through 9. John chapter 5, 2 through 9. This story perfectly illustrates the problem why the Bible isn't having its impact in our life as God would have it. John chapter 5, verse 2. If your faith is struggling, you've come to the right place. This story will increase that. John chapter 5, verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda which means having five porches. So there is a pool, and there's five porches on it, and they call that place Bethesda. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So the, the, the story goes that... At a time in the past, the trouble was, the water was stirred up, it started moving, that an angel touched it, and the first person that got into that water, when it started moving, was made whole. And so now you have all of these paralyzed, all these blind, all of these withered, all these people that have some kind of physical infirmity, some kind of ailment, and they sit around that pool day and night waiting for the water to be stirred so they can get into it. And then John takes the story even further. In verse 5, he tells us there's a particularly hard case at this pool. In verse 5, he says, And a certain man was there which had been for many 38 years. There was a man sitting at that pool, waiting for the water to be stirred so that he could jump in. And he had been there day and night, every day, with his infirmities, 38 years. Hmm. Sounds like he had a real problem. Sounds like he needed help. Sounds like the doctors at the time had nothing to offer him. Sounds like the counselors at the time had nothing to offer him. Sounds like he had been everywhere, and when everything else failed, he went to this pool and he parked himself there because he was in hopes that something would make him better. That this pool had that power. 
And today was his lucky day because he was about to have an encounter with Jesus. And in verse 6, we read about that. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will you be made whole? Now I want to focus on that question. But before I focus on that question, I find great comfort in knowing that Jesus saw this man, but when he saw him, he already knew him. This man had been there with this infirmity 38 years, and Jesus sees him and says, I know that man. I know the problem that he has. I know the infirmity he has. I need to go help him. I find it encouraging that Jesus doesn't need for me to tell him my situation. He already knows what I'm going through. Jesus knows the battle. He knows the struggle. He knows the infirmity. And when he looks at you and when he looks at me, he doesn't have to talk to others to get your story because he's already physically and intimately connected to you. And he knows your situation. And he seeks out this man at the pool of Bethesda because this man has an infirmity. He's been dealing with it and struggling for a long time, and he needs help. So Jesus seeks him out, and he gets to him, and he says, Listen, I know you've been struggling with this issue for a long time. I know that this is bringing you down. I know that it's preventing you from having desires in your heart. So what can I do to help you? Do you want to be made whole? Now, this is the King James, and it tends to break our jaw when we read it, but I'll moderately translate it for you. It's saying, Do you want me to heal you? Now, brothers and sisters, that's a great invitation from Jesus. Because if Jesus were in this building right now, no doubt, if he looked at you and he said, do you want me to heal you, there would be a line to get to him fastest. And I don't know about you. But if Jesus looked at me and says, do you want me to heal you? I would run. And like the children's story, I might actually be fast again. Jesus stands in front of this guy and he says, do you want me to heal you? And don't miss this man's response because it cuts right to our very nature. And John is showing a human problem that we all struggle with. The impotent man answered him, talking to Jesus, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus stands right there and asks that man if he wants to be whole. First thing a man thinks about is how Jesus came. He starts making excuses for why Jesus isn't going to be able to accomplish what he says he can accomplish. He says, Jesus, you can't put a pink elephant in that corner. Your word really doesn't have power. I need more than you just asking me a question. I need more than you just tell me as I read the stories that can happen. I need a man. I need a woman to help me out of my current situation. All too often, we come to God seeking His help. We come to God seeking His guidance. We open up His Word expecting an answer. And we read something, and then as soon as we get done reading it, just like this man, we start making excuses. Do you want to be whole today? Do you want to be healed? I love how Jesus responds to this man. This man does something very humanly, he makes an excuse. But Jesus still has his best interest in heart. I love this. I love this. There's just some things some people can get away with. You ever know people like that? They can do stuff that would be socially unacceptable, but they get away with it. Jesus does that right here. Look at this. Verse 8. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Sir, I need a man to help me. Just like, no, 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 stop. I've heard the excuses. 
I've been working with you for a long time. I've heard them all. I know what you're going to tell me. Just stop. Take up your bed and walk. Please, grasp hold of my promise. Trust in the power of my word and just do what I'm asking you to do. And you're going to be healed. Now, I love how this man responds. Because this is a lesson that all of us need to hear. In verse 9, look what he does. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. He heard the word of God. He believed in the power of the word of God. Now the reason why this story is so convincing to me, the reason why this story is so important to me, is because nowhere does it say Jesus bent down and grabbed the man's arm or grabbed him by his shoulder and helped him get on his feet and put him in the water. It doesn't say that. It says Jesus said, get up and walk. And when the man heard the words of Jesus telling him to get up and walk, something sparked in his heart that Jesus had the ability to do what he was saying he could do. He put his faith in that word and he started walking. Brothers and sisters, we don't need God himself down here to touch us. We don't need Jesus to touch us to deliver us. The power is in his word. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear him with our ears. The word of the living God is not merely written but spoken. Do we receive the Bible as the oracle of God? If we realize the importance of this word, with what awe would we open it and with what earnestness would we search its precepts? The reading and contemplating of the scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the most high. Brothers and sisters, my question to you is very simple. Are you reading the written word? Or are you reading the spoken word? You know what theology is, don't you? It's the study of religious philosophy. You know why philosophy is so confusing? Because they say statements just like that, and like Jesus. On the surface, it's the same thing. But I'm going to ask you the question again. Are you reading the written word of God? Or are you reading the spoken word of God? <clears throat> because I'm going to suggest to you that if you're merely reading the written word of God, you're missing its greatest advantage. But if you're reading the spoken word, you're opening yourself up for the miracles that God wants to accomplish in your life. You're opening yourself up for the change that Jesus wants to do in you. You're opening yourself up for the victory that God has. You're opening yourself up for the transformative grace that changes our mental perspective. You're opening yourself up for his purpose in your life, for his will in your life. You're opening yourselves up for those new relationships that you're seeking for. You're opening yourselves up for those new situations that he wants to implant in you. Do you believe that this is God's spoken word? Or is it just writing on pieces of paper? If you struggle with sin, go to God's word. If you have a relationship that's struggling, go to God's word. If you're searching for God's purpose in your life, go to his word. If you have mental handicaps, go to God's word. Mental disease is what I meant to say. I don't know why handicap came. But either way, go to God's word. If you're longing for something better than you have in your life right now, go to God's word. Because the Bible is not just for instruction, it's for construction. And God wants to remodel your lives. One of the most dramatic examples of the Bible's divine ability to transform men and women involved the famous mutiny on the bounty. Following the rebellion against the notorious Captain Bly, nine mutineers, along with the Tahitian men and women who accompanied them, found their way to Pekaren Island a tiny dot in the South Pacific, only two miles long and one mile wide. 
Ten years later, drinking and fighting made up the rest of, I'm sorry, ten years later, drinking and fighting had left only one man alive with 11 women and 23 children. So far, this is the familiar story made famous in the book in motion picture, but the rest of the story is even more remarkable. About this time, Adams came across the Bounty's Bible in the bottom of an old chest. He began to read it, and the divine power of God's word reached into the heart of that hardened murderer on a tiny volcanic speck in the vast Pacific Ocean and changed his life forever. The peace and love that Adams found in the Bible entirely replaced the old life of quarrel, brawling, and liquor. He began to teach the children from the Bible until every person on the island had experienced the same amazing change that he had found. Today, with a population of slightly less than 100, nearly every person on Pitcairn Island is a Christian. Brothers and sisters, the reason why we need to stare at the sun, but don't stare too long, the moon and the stars, the mountains and the beautiful Lake Superior, and everything else we see around us is because it reminds us that God spoke all that into existence. And the same power that spoke all that into existence is the same power in this world you hold in your hand to recreate your lives, to recreate your relationships, to recreate your situations. But I have to ask again, read it so we can figure out our instructions before leaving earth. Oh, that's good. But we read it because there's power in here to accomplish the change that you and God want to see. My prayer for this church on a regular basis is that every single one of us in this room, every single one of our members would come on fire and have a burning desire to read this word on a daily basis, and they would take hold of the promises and believe that there's power in here to change your lives. Because if we do that, our lives are going to be much better. Amen? Amen. Our closing hymn, sorry it's not a hymn, it's ancient words again. I don't know if we still have the 